Uh, the total number of COVID-19 related deaths has since climbed to 50,566. Now, pandemic data and analytics, that's a multidisciplinary group seeking to inform policy by considering explanations that allow us to count the human cost of COVID-19, had actually predicted some of these numbers all the way back from the first wave to take stock of the year gone by. From their perspective, let's bring in the group's coordinator, Nick Hudson, who joins us now via our video link. Nick, thanks for your time and welcome to the program. I have touched on this in some respects already, but perhaps as a start, let's briefly outline what you do as a group and why. Yeah, good morning to your listeners and to you, Ayanda. Panda has been set up to replace what we see as bad science with good science. We were alarmed at the prospect of a lockdown in South Africa. We thought it was an inappropriate strategy. We observed that all the prior respiratory virus pandemic guidelines were being ignored and torn up and thrown out in the process of rushing into lockdown in imitation of China. We thought that this would have a devastating effect on the country and we were very concerned. So we set about trying to replace some of the panicky narrative with some hard data. Interesting you say that science is not often thought of as a contentious issue because one, it's meant to rely on empirical data and uh, in many respects that's not debatable, one would hope. So what were you finding were some of the more contentious issues around the science that was being disseminated before this group was put together? Yeah, it's interesting the way you introduced that, Ayanda. I mean, the reality about science is that it proceeds by conjecture and criticism as competing explanations for what is going on are uh, assessed by many scientists and those explanations criticized and the, and the good ones survive until they're replaced by better ones. So this idea that there is a monolithic version of science that is irretrievable, indisputably correct is, is wrong. What we were seeing is that there were some important features being missed. The first one was that it was very clear that not everybody was susceptible to coronavirus. There was a large group of people who, who had pre-existing immunity to the disease. It was overwhelmingly affecting the elderly and the severely comorbid. And yet what the rest of the world was seeing, if you listen to the media and watch the news, your doctor captured it very, very well when he said, you know, they didn't know what to expect. They were basically expecting an Ebola and not something that is uh, more similar to the flu. You know, so a young doctor might have felt that he was at risk. Um, he, he, he used the word panic. That was exactly what was going on. Um, we were approaching this thing as, as if it was a plague, and mm. it wasn't one. Mm. Part of the, I imagine, contentious issues were around the lockdown. But, uh, you know, in a context where not much was actually known about the coronavirus, to your own admission, um, how, call it, um, unforgiving should we be of the, call it, misdiagnosis from the world of science that we've received uh, in the year that's gone by? I tend to be quite unforgiving for the reason I mentioned earlier. When you have guidelines in place it, and then the event arises, Doing your job entails following the guidelines. And what happened all over the world is that in a frenzy to imitate China based on a, the simple say-so that their lockdown had been effective, which the, the, you know, the uh, close analysis of the statistics is a con shows that that's a conclusion that cannot be drawn. You know, instead of, instead of uh, following the guidelines and doing their jobs, uh, these public health professionals panicked. And so I tend to be quite scathing about it also because we had several months of advance warning, as it were. You know, this was very much a northern hemisphere uh, phenomenon at first. And so if you were, instead of panicking, sitting calmly and looking at the data, you would have reached very different conclusions about the wisdom of rushing into a long lockdown, which would have a massive cost on the fabric of society and a public health consequence all of its own. Mm. Well, hold on. Um, I remember specifically the World Health Organization actually lauding South Africa for its quick response to the coronavirus, which in part entailed quite a stringent lockdown from the beginning. Are you suggesting that everyone got it wrong, including the WHO? No, not everybody, but definitely the World Health Organization got it wrong. They were the prime mover in this panic. A man by the name of Bruce Aylward returned from a very short visit to China and told everybody that that's what they should do, you know, lock down and do what the Chinese did. But what he was doing there was making a very strange assumption. He, he assumed that everybody was susceptible to the disease and that if China hadn't locked down, everybody would have died. 
But that was a very, very clearly not the, the case from the early data in places that were unable to lock down, such as the, the Diamond Princess cruise ship, where on a, on a vessel with thousands of people on board, only very old people got sick and only a tiny number died. I think it was 12 people or so. So the data was very clear that this notion of universal susceptibility was completely false. And that was the counterfactual that he had in his head when he, when he went to China and when he came back and told everybody to lock down. So we believe that the World Health Organization has been a disaster in this whole affair and that it was the main reason why everybody panicked. When they started panicking, everybody else panicked. And, and there have been countries that didn't panic. Many countries such as South Korea, Taiwan, Sweden famously. And, you know, when they didn't lock down, you didn't see this uh, indefinite exponentiation of deaths. They, they saw a, a very early uh, rate, the rate, the rate of decline started kicking in and they ended up with um, fairly unexceptional death numbers for the year. I think Sweden's um, excess mortality is incredibly low. If, depending on how you read the data, yeah. you can even make an argument for it having no excess mortality for the year. Um, and, you know, that was in the absence of any of these measures like school closures and business closures and stay-at-home orders and things like that, which have such a devastating effect on communities, especially communities of poor people. Interesting you say that because um, a, a quick Google search showed that Sweden's actually considering something like a lockdown amid a surge in COVID-19 cases. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I mean, uh, you know, one, many people would argue that there wasn't a single way of doing it. In fact, a lot of the argument here in South Africa was the lockdown is not going to stave off things like deaths. It's just going to buy us time so that we're able to at least boost our capability in the healthcare system. And hopefully the result from that would be that there would be less people dying even after being admitted in hospital because the hospitals aren't overwhelmed. So that was the golden thread running through it. We've obviously, we've learned now that perhaps the cost to getting there simply wasn't worth it. And that's the point you're making, I presume. Well, yes, that is very, that is one of the points we're making, but it was also clear that, you know, because of it, it, you, these, these two things go hand in hand. The panic Panic caused people to overproject the hospital resources and therefore to prize the, the goals of lockdown too highly. But even by the time our lockdown was implemented, it was clear that these field hospitals that were being set up, such as the Javits Center, the USS Mercy um, in London and New York, uh, were not being utilized. And we didn't take note of that. Instead, what we did was we brought out these models which overestimated hospital demand by between 13 and 27 times. And then we did things like building the NASRAC center at a cost of 350 million rand. And that center had less than one and a half thousand patients during the whole episode at a cost of about a quarter of a million rand a patient. You know, so you see how the panic and the bad modeling fed into a massive misallocation of scarce resources in a country that has many other more pressing problems. Uh, we've probably created bigger problems than coronavirus simply you know, for, for individual causes of death, such as TB and HIV, by diverting healthcare resources from those much, much more significant problems to this one, which was visible at the, visibly at the time a much smaller problem. Mm. We also know, though, that despite all the disagreements, many people do agree that forecasting is not a perfect science. There's a margin yes. of er error, whichever way you look at it. But there's the hope that as we collect more data, we'll get better at doing so. Do you share that with the sentiment that we are getting better? I think one has to be very modest in one's um, aims with forecasting. Uh, I think these epidemic models are most useful from the point of view of understanding the dynamics of infection and that when you begin to use them as policy planning devices, you're on very dangerous territory. Uh, epidemic, a thing like an epidemic is a very, very complex thing. And it, there are many more real-world uh, factors that influence outcomes than you can possibly absorb into your model. So, for example, what proportion of people had pre-existing immunity to coronavirus? We were never going to find that out before the model was ready to go. What was the, the actual age-based infection fatality rate going to be? What would be the effect of reducing the mobility of young people on the likelihood of those old people being exposed to the, to the um, disease. All of those things are almost impossible to forecast. And so when you set the model up, you need to be very modest about how accurate you think it's going to be. 
And you know, so f so for example, you know, one of, one of the tragedies that I think happened here is that that people didn't pay enough attention to the very strongly age-specific mortality. This is overwhelmingly a disease that over -effect, that affects old and severely comorbid people. And so we missed a golden opportunity by failing to recognize that children are more or less not at risk. Mm -hmm. So you know, one of the insights we've had um, over, the, you know, over the last many months is that when you reduce the mobility of the youngsters in your society, what you're effectively doing is reducing their mobility relative to the vulnerable people. And what that has the effect of doing is it shifts the disease burden onto the older people. And that is, we believe, one of the factors, one of the reasons why South Africa has ended up with amongst the worst coronavirus mortality st statistics yep. by age group in the world. Nick Hudson, fascinating discussion. We're going to have to fold it there, sadly. I really appreciate your making time to chat to us. Nick Hudson is the coordin coordinator of Pandemics Data and Analytics, and that's a group uh, of... Uh, Scientists, if you like, who are seeking to inform policy through explanations that allow us to actually count the real cost of COVID-19. Nick, thanks very much indeed.